All right. If you just got here, sorry, uh, I'm going to have to catch you all up. Um, no, <laughs> let's just get started. I had I had a bunch of great obligatory jokes about Texas that I was going to use, but let's just skip those and, and get started. Welcome, everyone, to the session, Websites for the Middle Child, How Open Aid is Helping Mid-Sized Nonprofits. My name is Clayton Dewey. I'm a developer with Atten Design Group and co-maintainer of OpenAid, a Drupal distribution for nonprofits and NGOs. Um, I'm also a proud uh, parent of three children, which will come into play later in the session. So, A little bit more about Atten Design Group. We are a web strategy design and development shop based in Denver. Started back in 2000. Uh, we've been working with Drupal for quite a while. Um, I think Drupal 5, maybe even earlier. Uh, we work with people doing good in the world, uh, whether they be nonprofits, uh, non governmental organizations, international aid organizations, journalist organizations, um, higher education institutions. So uh, that's, that's our thing. Uh, so let's go back to a time before open aid. Let's go back all the way back to the early aughts, a time when Clayton Dewey was a young anarcho-punk with lots of ideals and was happy to have a dorm room. I don't know what's in the bag there, but um, back in those days, I uh, got together with a developer friend of mine and we launched a site called the Rocky Mountain Resistor that we thought was going to change the world and in a small way, maybe it did. Um, it was fun to look back, thank you, um, archive, um, org for this um, domestic partnership. It was fun to look at these two headlines. Domestic partnership and Colorado now has at least um, civil marriage. It's still illegal um, based on the Constitution, but that and then Florida farm workers visiting with Chipotle and that's a successful campaign. Chipotle agreed to their demands, so kind of cool to look back and see the two articles there and the gains that have been made since then. So yay, yeah. Um, and so that's how I got into Drupal, was, uh, was hobbyist, activist, just on my own, like there's no staff, no funds for this, um, and it was a lot of fun. Um, I went on to be a public school teacher for five years, uh, got burnt out by the public school system and decided I wanted to do something else and returned back to Drupal and got really uh, interested in, in its aspects, especially around its identity as an open source technology, the community around it, um, and then uh, came in touch with Atten Design, and they do good for the world with Drupal, and I wanted to do good for the world with Drupal, and so it was a great fit. Um, and still, this is before OpenAid. Uh, Atten Design worked with and continues to work with uh, a lot of those different um, organizations doing good in the world. And in that time, we discovered that there were certain feature sets that are very common for nonprofits and NGOs. Um, and, and these probably won't come as a surprise to, to all of you in the audience, but I'll just kind of talk through a few of those briefly. So um, for the International Center for Journalists, we built a, a blog platform for them, um, a, which had blog posts that tie to author profiles. For the International Center for Transitional Justice, we built a new section that was uh, very similar in terms of functionality. And then uh, guess what uh, What else we built? We built blog news. Uh, for another project, we built a blog and news section. Uh, this is for knowledge for health. Uh, and so uh, again, when we continue to do this, we continue to see this feature set. Probably not a surprise to everyone. Uh, another common feature set is project mapping. This is a great way to demonstrate an organization's impact in a geographically dispersed area, in this case globally. Uh, so again, this is for ICFJ. Uh, project mapping, well, program mapping in this case for ICTJ. And then uh, field activities for Knowledge for Health. And of course, each of these had their own particular set of needs, but as we can see, there's kind of some common, uh, common functionality that, that we're seeing here. And it was this organization, Knowledge for Health, um, that we started to have these conversations about this, about these common feature sets that nonprofits and aid organizations see and need. And in the case for Knowledge for Health, they have affiliate organizations that are part of that larger um, group 
and um, they they had the need of being able to spin up new sites for these affiliate organizations. Um, and launching a website's not a simple, easy task, but we decided, well, they are looking for a lot of the same features. Let's build a distribution that we can use to help their team uh, quickly and more easily roll out websites for these affiliate organizations. And so that is where OpenAid um, came from originally. Um, so we worked with Knowledge for Health, Johns Hopkins, and USAID to build OpenAid, a distribution for um, NGOs and nonprofits. And so we'll talk a little bit about some of those organizations. So Knowledge for Health, or K for Health for short, uh, works with like global health issues. And uh, here are some of those affiliate organizations. So one is Stop Cholera, um, and they work to ensure that populations who are at risk of cholera uh, benefit from receiving the oral cholera vaccine, or OCV. And so this website helps, or this website houses information about OCV, um, research around it. Another organization is Voices for a Malaria Free Future, and they work with the private sector in various African countries to help uh, promote best practices around malaria prevention, uh, particularly with soccer teams and um, sort of leveraging the uh, celebrity status of sports figures to help, um, to help promote that amongst the population. Um, M Health Working Group uh, works with mobile technology and how that can help positively impact uh, global health practices. So those are just three of those affiliate organizations that now have their own uh, specific web presence uh, thanks to OpenAid. Um, now that we've talked just briefly about that, I'll kind of dive into uh, the feature set of OpenAid a little bit more. So the features that come with OpenAid. Um, we've talked a bit about some of those. The need for a blog, link to author profiles, um, image gallery is another one. Um, project mapping, as I kind of alluded to earlier, resource library, and a responsive theme. So um, let's take a closer look at some of those. So the homepage to start with. So here again is Voices for a Malaria-Free Future. Uh, at the top of the homepage, we have an image carousel to uh, highlight featured content. Off to the right is a hero block. Um, so this is uh, a place for an organization to uh, to include a, a like attention grabbing, compelling um, statement about the organization and the work they do. Scrolling down further, we have a river of news content. This is the latest updates, a teaser view of typically it's blog posts, but really this can pull from any content type uh, that's part of OpenAid. If you um, and then flagging it as promoted to the front page, we'll get that content up here. Uh, to the right of that is a partners block, and this is scrollable um, because we've found that there is a, there can be some important sort of political implications of of being able to feature all partners or at least certain partners on the homepage. That's that's an important thing to have to do for certain organizations. Um, that status is important to those partners. So there, um, if you have more than three, you're able to feature all of them and be able to scroll through them. Um, f further down the page, then we have the project map, and so each point here is a project node, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, social media block below that, and then a simple footer. The theme is responsive out of the box, and so at smaller screen sizes, we see the collapsed menu. The image carousel is using Flex Slider, so um, it works great on any device. Um, and then the latest updates and other content falls below that. So the project mapping. So a project is a content type, so each project is its own node. And here's a just the general projects landing page. We have a teaser view of all of the projects. It's then paginated if need be. And then off to the right again is that project map. And we're currently using open layers for that. Um, in OpenAid2, which I'll speak to in just a minute, uh, we'll be using Leaflet for that. Here's the back end, here's the location field. So uh, using open layers, you would then select the point at which you would like that pro, uh, project to reside and, sh and display on the map. Here's a look at the project detail page. And so we have the title, body field. This uh, Google map here is, is just an embedded map into the body field itself. So 
Um, and then off to the right, we see that download section. So there's a file field there associated with the project type to be able to upload uh, files that are relevant to that project. Below that is a, there's the, you'll see like right below the map is that link to partners. And so one can associate partner, a partner or partners that are involved in that project. And then again, off to the right is that project map again. And so selecting a point on that project map uh, provides an overlay with a link to the title of the project to then click into that detail page. The resource library, uh, so this is, a, this is a great place for an organization who has original content to be able to organize and display those resources in an easy to find manner for site visitors. And so here's a look again at the resources uh, page. It's a list of resources with post date and title um, and description if there is one. Um, and then the uh, various filtering options off to the right. And here's a look at a specific resource page. And so, you know, title, content type, post date, description, link to the original file, um, and then some tagging. Uh, so resource type and then the language. The image gallery we, is another feature that we discovered is a helpful one for um, organizations, especially if they're international or geographically dispersed again. If an organization has a, a constituency that's across the globe, then some constituencies might not be as familiar with certain regions that they're operating in. And so an image gallery is a great way um, and just media in general is a great way to add a little bit more um, connection between supporters and the work that's being done abroad. And so here's a look at the general photo gallery. So each of these galleries, we have a thumbnail of one image from the gallery. It's the most recently added image and some description text. And so the way this is set up is that each we have an image content type, and so each image is its own node. And then the galleries are part of a gallery vocabulary, and so each gallery is a taxonomy term. Um, and then, so then image nodes uh, are then tagged with the relevant gallery terms. So here's a look at, uh, at one gallery and all of the images associated with it. And then here is a specific image node page. And so again, because this is a content type, then there's some additional fields to add metadata to the image, such as um, photographer attribution, the data was taken. Um, and of course, like with any of this, this is Drupal, so this can be extended, of course. The blog is a lot like what you saw in the previous uh, screenshots of, of past projects we have. Uh, just a blog landing page that displays a teaser view of each blog post is sorted in p by post date, uh, filters them by month and topic, and then a link off to the side for author profiles. And an author profile is a content type that can then be associated to a blog post. Here's a look at the blog detail page. So um, pretty straightforward, title, um, post date, the author profile if they've associated uh, with an author node, um, body text, and then off to the right again, that same filter set and list of author profiles. And then the author profile detail page looks like this. And so we heard first of how OpenAID came about originally to help Knowledge for Health. And so it, it's a really good use case for organizations that have a lot of affiliate organizations that need websites uh, spun up. Um, the, uh, another use case is for organizations that are limited on time and budget. And this was the case with the new climate economy. And so the new climate economy is a simpler, catchier name for the Global Commission on the Economy and the Climate. Uh, and this is a new international initiative to analyze and communicate the economic benefits and costs of acting on climate change. So these are former world leaders and just leaders in the private sector who are working to advocate for uh, 
for companies to be involved in, in the climate change, um, I don't know, movement to help address climate change. And they needed their website to launch, and God, it was not a lot of time. <laughs> I think we developed it for two weeks. There was some time ahead of time just to establish identity and goals. Um, but the actual development time was, was even, yeah, uh, two weeks, even kind of shorter, like a week and a half, um, because they needed to launch this site in time for the United Nations General Assembly. They had a, a high-profile press release that was coinciding with that, and they came to us pretty late in the game needing a website. And um, initially we thought, I don't know if that's a practical thing to do, but we looked at their feature set and their requirements and realized that it matched up really well with OpenAid. And so, um, so we pitched that idea and they were like, yeah, that sounds great. So we used OpenAid as a starting point and then just had to adjust a couple of things with the theme, um, add a few basic pages, and uh, rename the blog content type to news, and we were able to launch um, well within the time frame they were looking at. And this is gonna get into where I get really passionate about things in a second. But um, so here's a, just a look at their approach landing page, their news section, right? this is the blog that was altered to be a news section. Um, so yeah, uh, and I'm like 16 minutes into this presentation and you're probably wondering, Clayton, what about the middle child? You put that into your session title is absurdly long. Why, what, you haven't mentioned it at all. There's no mention of middle child. Well, thank you for hypothetically bringing that up, audience. I'll tell you why I haven't mentioned the middle child yet. And that's because the middle child is always ignored and I'm trying to make a point by not talking about the middle child as evidenced by this image here. And I don't know if there's any other image that evokes the same kind of emotion as this one does for me, which is like extreme amusement and just sadness. But it's like the expression just is so perfect. Um, and I can say that I'm an expert in this field of the middle child condition uh, because I was the oldest of three. And so I know what it's like to be the older brother of a middle child. Here is a picture of myself and my brother Vernon. This is before he was the middle child. Look at how happy he was. He was just so full of life and cuteness. And then let's just fast forward to this time. <laughs> wow, he's just not impressed. He just kind of hates everything. Um, just zooming in a little bit closer. The crossed arms, the scowl is from years of being overlooked. Uh, it's it's rough. Um, so let's dive a little bit deeper into this the characteristics of a middle child because this is this is a great metaphor. This this just translates perfectly to a mid sized nonprofit. This is going to be very valuable use of everyone's time. Trust me. So the middle child. What is what are the characteristics that define the middle child? Well, first of all, they're extremely annoying. Uh, you're in your seventh grade. You started your awesome grunge band called Curmudgeon. This is named after an obscure Nirvana song. And you're having a great time with your cool friends. And then all of a sudden, your younger brother comes in with his recorder and is like, hey, guys, can I join your band? No, get out of here, Vernon. And that leads me to the second thing. They're crybabies. They start crying about that. And that goes on to the next thing, which is their tattletales. They tell their mom, mom, I want to be in the band. Let me in the band. And then you have to, and they're the drummer, and they have no rhythm, and they ruin your life, and they ruin your band. That's the characteristic of a middle child. This carries over even to, into my own children. Take a look at this family photo and see if you can identify who is the middle child of my three. It might take a second. Yeah, that's right. Ember with the Mario t-shirt. This was like the seventh shot. I had closed my eyes in all of them before that. And then he throws this in the run. Uh, like, he does this. And of course I'm joking because I love Ember and I love my brother. He's like one of my best friends actually. He lives five minutes away. Um, and I, I love Ember so much I had this statue commissioned for him in his honor. You can go to City Park in Denver and see it for yourself. Um, so... So yeah, so what can we draw from the middle child analogy? So the middle child nonprofit, 
Um, so the characteristics, again, would be uh, they're knowing, they're crybabies, they're tattletales. Um, no, that's not actually, that's not fair. Um, so let me, I'll, I'll be serious now. So the middle child, well, let's first kind of define what I'm talking about because this isn't actually a great descriptor of, of the kind of nonprofit I'm talking about. Um, the kind of nonprofit I'm talking about is complex in the sense that it might be an organization that is distributed and working uh, on issues geographically dispersed. Um, it could be an organization that has more than one project going on, multiple projects. Um, and then organizations that are media rich. So really, this isn't even necessarily mid-sized nonprofits in terms of budget or staff numbers, um, but just simply a nonprofit that is basically is doing more than what a blog or a static page would warrant. And the other um, characteristic is that they're broke. They don't have a lot of money. Um, and again, this is, so like mid-sized nonprofit is not very accurate because there are a ton of nonprofits that are in this situation. And of course, broke is a relative term, but um, just looking at U.S. nonprofits, we can see this breakdown. Um, this is all nonprofits that reported their total assets to the IRS. And so this is, there are 817,145 U.S. nonprofits in this status. That's a ton of nonprofits. So there's, there are a lot of organizations out there that just cannot afford um, a, a feature-rich website. And yet, um, they're doing amazing, badass work. Uh, and so they're limited in tech resources. They're limited in budget. And what all too often ends up happening is that they end up in a situation like this. Right. They end up in a, in a WordPress site, they end up in a blog, like just using Blogger. Some of them don't even have websites. And there are some really, you know, really small nonprofits, community groups where this suffices, and this is fine. Um, but there's a lot of organizations where they're doing more work than what something like WordPress or a simple blogging platform can handle and can do justice. And so, um, so I'll just kind of point to one example. So this is the Indigenous Environmental Network, and they're one of these groups that I admire a lot. They do amazing work, and, um, and yet they're, because they have limited tech resources, because they have limited financial resources, um, they're kind of pigeonholed into a, a WordPress site where they have a ton of rich content, but it almost becomes a sort of design liability um, it's difficult, it can be difficult to, to find the content as a user that one would need. Um, and some of that can be addressed with information architecture and content strategy. Um, but a lot of this is just the limitations of the platform they're on. And this, this has serious impacts on the type of work that an organization can do. And my experience is that these organizations that have limited web presences are making up for this with their on-the-ground work. They're doing incredible work outside of their website, and that's great, but, um, but obviously that's still impacting the work that they're doing. It impacts reputation, um, it, it, which leads to funding, um, respect from the media, uh, it impacts followers and their ability to engage with people. And if, you're, if I'm a user and I'm coming to the site, it's difficult for me to know where to start or how to get involved or how to follow the work that they're doing. And um, as we scroll down, it's uh, just the amount of campaigns they're working on, the issues, um, is, is, uh, is incredible. But it's not, this is not doing their work justice. And it's getting in the way of, it's, it's not a tool that's helping uh, facilitate the work that they could be doing. And of course, like this is not, I'm not harping on them as an organization because this is the reality for so many organizations that they just do not have the resources and they probably um, probably had someone sympathetic to their cause like throw up a, web, a WordPress site for them and they were just happy even with that. Um, and this is where something like OpenAid I think can really um, make a huge impact. When we look through that feature set, it's the, uh, if, if you're a Drupal developer, you're probably underwhelmed by that. Like creating a blog is not that significant. The project mapping is a little bit more complex, but really, it's it's just these out of the box Drupal um, driven solutions that 
that aren't being kind of used um, or tapped into. So, um, so OpenAid can be one of those answers. It's not the only one, but it's one, and it's one that we're we're um, we're contributing back and wanting to see used in this in this use case. Um, so one example is the Arab Resource Collective, and again, this they rolled their own theme. It's not super fancy, right? As a designer, I'd look at this and be like, hmm, okay. Um, but if you compare it to the Indigenous Environmental Network, it's clean. It's easy to find the information that one needs. Um, and so this is an organization based in Lebanon. As a just, um, yeah, they, they just took this on their own, like no, no staff, like no like real funding, um, enrolled this on their own. Um, and because... Because OpenAid and, and Drupal in general just has a better content modeling system um, than some of these other platforms I mentioned, they're able to have these well-structured um, sites. Another example is MediPiece. This is a group based in Seoul, and they work, uh, they work around um, disaster-stricken and conflict-stricken areas. And so again, like small staff, um, they were able to use OpenAid to establish a nice, solid, clean web presence. And so when I joined the company, OpenAid had already been launched. Um, but I started talking with Justin, the owner, and some of the other employees, and how I was excited about taking this product that we'd put out there. We released the project um, and, and doing a little bit more with it. So um, we looked at OpenAid, and we decided, like, one of the first things we wanted to do was work on a new theme. Um, and in that process, we kind of struggled um, to find the time uh, and momentum to drive forward OpenAid 2. And so we came up with the idea of um, finding a grassroots organization that we could partner with and help uh, move that forward. Um, and then that would, one, like, kind of obligate us a little bit more, even though this is on our non-billable time to work on OpenAid, if we knew that there was an organization that was kind of counting on us, that we would figure out a way to, to work that into our schedules. Um, and then the second thing is that before I got into Drupal, one thing I, I encountered often was this gap between techies and activists, and techies having these really cool ideas, but they not being grounded in the actual needs of activists and nonprofits and grassroots organizations. So we didn't want to fall into that same trap, so we... We thought that partnering with a with an organization would help ground that and and help us guide the sort of decisions and priorities that we needed to make in developing open aid too so that's what we did sorry everyone for doing that i couldn't help uh so uh so I approached uh, justin our owner and I was like all right i'm going to talk to justin i'm going to pitch this idea." where I'm going to suggest that we work with an organization that has very little money or no money to, 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 to give us and just work with them anyway. I don't know if he's going to think that's a good idea, but whatever. I'm just going to go into his office and talk about it. So I sit down. We start talking about it. I'm like, hey, I think it would be good to partner with a nonprofit organization. And he's like, nice. head. I'm like, yeah, yeah, totally, totally. And then um, and he's like, stops. And he's like, interesting. Um, which is usually what he says when he doesn't like an idea. Um, and I was like, maybe I shouldn't suggest my next suggestion, which is a nonprofit that doesn't have any money. And he's like, all right, I got this idea. How about we work with the most broke, grassroots nonprofit we can find? It's just like, do it for free. And so I was like, oh, okay, cool. I guess that is actually a good idea. So we did that. So I went on Facebook, and I was like, hey, our company's making it, this cool distribution. It's open source. Anyone need a new website? And, uh, you know, <laughs> we got a couple of people interested. Um, and here's just a few. So advocates for environmental human rights are doing a lot of really cool work around environmental justice envir and environmental racism. A local group in Colorado, the Elephant Circle, um, they helped pass a law in 2010 that prohibits the shackling of incarcerate, incarcerated women during labor, which you would think is just not legal, but 
in Colorado it was, which is insane. Um, and they helped improve some laws in 2011 that, uh, around the regulation of home, uh, home midwives, like home birth midwives. Uh, the Mississippi Workers' Center for Human Rights doing some really awesome work around living wage battles and, again, like environmental racism issues. Um, the Navajo Nation government, which is you know, the largest indigenous nation in the United States. Um, and, and a ton more. These are just a few. Um, and, and some of these, we're, we're still in talks with, with them. Like once Open Aid 2 is, is rolled out, maybe we can coordinate some barn raising events to help them get on that platform. Um, but we finally settled on the Housing Rights Network. Um, it's a pretty new network, and actually the Housing Rights Network is not their official name. They're still like, de deliberating on that. Um, but the organizations that are involved in the network are not that new. A lot of them have been around for a while. Um, and we chose to work with them because they fit um, sort of the middle child characteristics that I talked about before. They're geographically distributed. They have organizations in Detroit, Chicago, Madison, Miami, uh, New York City, San Francisco. And it's, it's a network that's continuing to grow and, and gain momentum. Um, another reason is that their various um, organizations are making a lot of news. They're, ma they're doing a lot of interesting, um, edgy, and, and inspiring work around uh, foreclosures, um, around unlawful evictions, um, and they have a lot of original resources. And so one thing that characterizes a lot of them is that they're doing? They're organizing these civil disobedience actions called um, eviction blockades, and um, and I can talk afterwards about the politics behind that because it brings up a lot of different opinions from people. But um, essentially, they have a huge need for a resource library because these eviction blockades, again, they're illegal. They're, they're acts of civil disobedience, and so there's a lot of questions around how to coordinate something like that, how to do it. Um, safely, like the legal repercussions because that varies state to state. Um, and they're just, at this point, they're just inundated with phone calls and questions from people who are like, we're at this point, we want to organize this, we have a ton of questions about it. Um, and so developing this resource library is going to be really great to to be able to direct people to these questions that come up repeatedly for them. And, and be able to, to free themselves to be doing other work. Um, so yeah, so we're really excited to work with them. And here, their current situation is, like I kind of, like we've seen earlier, is that they're, they're using these much more simple sort of platforms to establish a web presence. So the Chicago anti-eviction campaign is using Blogger. Um, Take Back the Land is, I think it's just like this custom rolled website that works very poorly. It took forever for that page to load, for me to even take a screenshot. Um, Eviction Free San Francisco is probably the most solid website, and this one actually stands on its own pretty well, I'd say, um, given the size and the funding of the organization. Um, so, uh, so, that's, so that's a little bit about the Housing Rights Network, um, who we decided to partner with to drive OpenAid to um, forward. And so we went through a, a similar process that we would with any client. We started with a project kickoff call, in which we learned more about the clients personally, as, who they are as people, um, what their, how they got into this work, their passions, uh, what the goals of the organization are. Um, and then we worked with them around audience and defining tar target audience and what they wanted, um, like what conversion looks like for, um, for a nonprofit and for their website, and then went into content maps. Um, and in those talks, I kind of came up with these points, um, but I, I feel like I'm still always learning a little more and more about the needs of nonprofits. But um, these are some of them that I found, which is that which is that the platform is approachable. It's easy to work with. It's it has an intuitive interface. Um, that whatever it is, it's well documented because. Typically, you're handing this over to an organization. They're not going to have the funds to have a prolonged support contract with, um, with a development shop or even a freelancer. Sometimes it's, they're on their own. So things need to be well documented if they need to customize something 
or um, apply a security update, something like that. That it's easy to install, right? That it's flexible. Um, I, I hear these horror stories all the time of organizations um, working in and, and having this website launch and it looks the way they want it to look at the time, but then the ability to then customize it or even change, like sometimes it's just simple even changing out some of the content is extremely difficult and the platform is brittle and they're just stuck in this, in this website that they can't grow with. Um, a responsive theme I think these days is just needs to happen. Um, that it's stable, uh, I know Sometimes on our end, we get excited about new features, but the more I've talked with nonprofits, a lot of times they, they value that stability more than this like, cool new features being rolled out all the time. Um, and then it's supported in some way. And this is something that I'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation and sort of the challenge around that. But, uh, so here, is, uh, here are the comps for OpenAid2 that I'm really excited about. Um, and so we decided it needed to be simple, it needed to be beautiful, it needed to be engaging. Um, so that, yeah, so that it is flexible, that simplicity allows for that flexibility. And so we start with a large attention getting marquee section here. The text, the text in yellow and the link text, which is white, are both customized, right? You can, you can change that easily. Um, the link can either be to an internal page or external page. And again, like these features are not, this is sort of underwhelming features for a Drupal developer, but, but they're really, in, they're, they're small, but they're really important. Um, if we scroll down further, we have the project map, which looks kind of funny in this comp because there's only two projects that are in there, but I'm, usually if you're having projects, you'll be featuring more than two. Anyway, um, and then off to the right, that's where that hero statement now lives that you saw earlier that was off to the right of the image carousel. Um, below that, we have featured organizations. So this is a teaser view of uh, featured organizations, which typically is going to be featured projects. So I guess I should step back and say, um, so for the Housing Rights Network, we're taking the project content type and just renaming it to organization because that's more relevant to them. And further down the page, there's the latest update se section again, but reworked there. And another thing, Another feature that we're developing here is the ability to swap out this latest updates block with evergreen content because we've learned that um, there's some organizations that for whatever reason they're not going to be um, like publishing news articles about themselves that frequently. And so if you have a latest update section and the last post is from a year and a half ago, that goes back to that reputation issue. And it just looks bad on the organization, but maybe the work they're engaged in is more longer term. It just doesn't make sense to write about it. Or maybe they just, their content strategy, they've decided that blogging actively on their website just is not serving their mission. And so we need a way to accommodate for that. And so this can be swapped out then with resources or some other evergreen content. So they're not, so the website is not a burden on them in that sense of like feeling like you need to constantly be churning out new content. Um, off to the right, that take the pledge block is what we're calling a call to action block. And so again, that title text, the body text and the link text can all be customized. Um, you can also just replace that with a, with a single image and that'll link out to wherever you specify. Um, and there can be up to three blocks there off to the right. The partners block um, below that, we opted out from using that scrollable functionality because it's just a little bit goofy on mobile devices. Um, and then, yeah, the social media block down uh, next to a simple footer. And then for the, this is a comp for the projects page, or in this case, is an organization page. So title, body, some related links. Those are link fields, a uh, contact section. And then below is the project map again. And then a thumbnail from the associated image gallery. And if they have more than one image gallery, then that's the view all link that you see off to the right next to the view gallery. Um, below that, we have the latest updates from an organization. And so this is a new, this is a, a small but new and I think 
sort of important feature that we're adding, which is the ability to reference um, projects to news articles. And the same goes for uh, photo galleries. And so um, for some of these organizations, this is actually going to, this will be their web presence. This is actually more robust and um, suited for their needs than, than, their, than their own website is. Um, and then off to the right, we have the resources block. So again, um, we're, we're adding that ability in OpenAid to, to be able to reference a project to resources. So, um, so yeah, that's OpenAid 2. Um, we're really excited about it. Uh, the feature set doesn't change too much, but there's a couple of important tweaks that I'm really excited about that just makes that project page just really uh, a bit more rich. Um, but we decided as a first priority that was that was really the big that was what we wanted to prioritize was a new design. Um, and now we have lots of next steps. Um, it's exciting to think of all the different directions that we can take it in. Um, we've talked about um, adding something like Red Hen or Civi CRM um, interaction with it. We've talked about um, adding a donation functionality uh, events. Um, and so those are all going to sort of be dependent on the input we receive from the community. Um, some of these will be able to build out in contracts similar to what we did with Knowledge for Health so that it's, it's paid work, but the organization wants it built back into open aid, which is always really exciting. Um, and as far as when open aid 2 will be released, we're in the middle of implementing the theme now. Almost all the back end functionality is complete. And so we're going to make a big push to try and get this ready for the Allied Media Conference at the end of June, um, because the Housing Rights Network folks are going to be there, and it would just be really fun to have it launched for them then. Um, but we will see. Um, if not, then say like one to three months is our, is our timeline for that. Uh, so next, I'm just going to make a pitch to get involved. The best way to get involved if you're interested in OpenAid as a project is to join the group, groups.drupal.org slash OpenAid. This is a place to ask questions about OpenAid. If you're organizing a barn raising event, you can post an event to the page. Um, we're going to, we've started to be more active on this group page and we're going to continue to be even more active in terms of announcing features, announcing times that people can uh, sprint on the project. Um, so that's, that's the first and foremost best way to get involved if you're interested um, as a developer or, or, or end user. Um, another way, this was a really cool thing that happened. There was a hackathon that took place in Mumbai, India, where they, um, some developers used OpenAid to revamp an NGO's website. And we didn't even, had never even heard of this company or these people. They just kind of did out of the blue and found out about it on Twitter, which was really, really neat. Um, of course, you can download OpenAid at its project page, drupal.org slash project slash OpenAid. And the issue queue, of course, is a good place to look. Um, although I'd say if you're a developer looking to contribute, this is a good way to kind of see the current status of OpenAid 1. But if you're interested in OpenAid 2, you should um, join that group or find me. <laughs> um, so there's the issue queue. We have an IRC channel because everyone has an IRC channel. And I'm always, I'm, I've always have it open. So you can go in there and ask a question. Uh, it's a great way to get like real time response. Um, and openaiddistro.org is sort of our main marketing page for it. And following us on Twitter at OpenAid Distro is also a great way to keep up with updates and, yeah, you know, social media stuff. So thank you, everyone. Um, you can follow me at Clay Bolto on Twitter. Uh, CE Dewey is my Drupal handle, so you can send me a private message that way as well. And so now I think we have five or ten minutes if there are any questions. Um, otherwise, people can go eat dinner. And yeah. <laughs> um, and then if you have a question, if you want to just come to the mic, because this is being recorded, uh, and then people watching it can hear your question. So.
All right. Thanks for your talk. I appreciate your time. Um, Two-part question. Uh, first, uh, is the distribution geared towards uh, production and development, or do you can uh, the NGO just spin it up themselves and get started with it? The NGO can spin it up and get started, you know, out of the box. But we, I would say, actually, it's more common for people to start with OpenAid and then customize it from there. So it's definitely meant for that as well. In that case, um, you're going to want to just take responsibility from it from there and treat it more like an install profile, where you will be the one to to update the module, like make security updates. You know, if um, I guess I'm not sure your background, so I don't know how like technical. It, yeah, yeah. So I, I, we, okay. we run a distribution. We've done install profiles, but yeah. uh, just kind of learning how other people do it. It's yeah, something yeah. that's important to me. So uh, mm -hmm. my second part of my question was, what, what's the blank canvas like? What do you get as soon as you run the install profile? What's that look like? Uh, everything that I sh showed up there is what you get out of the box. Okay, so if you yeah. you you ran your install profile, you would what would you say? I mean, there, there's no content in there. You just got a bunch of features. Yeah, yeah. So you would turn on a bunch of features. As soon as you add a blog, right, then it would show up in the blog post there. Okay. As soon as you add a marquee node, then it would show up in that image carousel. Um, although with OpenAid 2, this is probably not going to happen in the first rollout. But another thing that we want to do is provide sample content out of the box um, and Rather than that sample content just being lorem ipsum, uh, we're going to structure it so that you know the sample blog post is from like a fictitious nonprofit and is structured in an effective like how you should be writing a blog post for the web because that's another aspect of this that we've discovered is that a lot of folks um, don't have a lot of experience writing for the web and they're great at writing for prints. Um, but not necessarily for the web. So that sample content will be there to so that when you turn on the site, it's not just this bare canvas, but that and helpful information on how to write effectively, how to take pictures effectively, and use the marquee responsibly, that sort of thing. So yeah, that's yeah. a similar problem that we were experiencing. It's like we, they spin it up. It's like, okay, what do I do now? Yeah. Uh, wh yeah. What do you think your strategy for your sample content is going to be? Like the migrate module or? Um. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Haven't thought that far through. Yeah, okay. we, we've thought about it. Um, we haven't settled on an approach. I don't know if you have any suggestions because we're still, we're still kind of batting that back. Yeah, and forth. I think I think we're probably in this similar spot. But uh, mm -hmm. interesting to see how it plays out. Yeah, and and what distro was it that you all? Uh, with? We have an internal distro for Wild Cornell Medical College. So we're, okay. a lot of times we're spinning up sites uh, for like lab laboratories doing research. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They might have someone who's somewhat technical, but they're they don't know Drupal. Right. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Hi. Before I knew about Open Aid, I did a site with Open Outreach. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you can just tell me what the significant differences are. Yeah. Um, I think the, the easiest way to explain the differences is at the moment, Open Outreach is more geared towards member based organizations, and Open Aid is geared more towards project based organizations. So, in the sense that Open Outreach is a really good distribution if you're looking to actively engage your user base in campaigns, signing up as members, um, whereas Open Aid is a lot more about communicating one's message. And that's because originally it came out of the international aid space. Um, now that we worked with the Human Rights Network, which is a lot more grassroots and members-based, the functionality is kind of shifting to encompass that as well. Um, so uh, though Open Outreach, I think, frankly, does a better job of that than Open Aid. So if that's your priority, then I would suggest that. Um, it's, Especially if you have the resources to take their theme and and do something really great with it, or at least something that works. Um, I know that their theme is pretty bare bones, and so it's good for developers. But if you're wanting something out of the box, it's a little limiting. Okay. Yeah. And then can I ask one more question? Mm -hmm. I don't want to keep people from dinner and drinks and stuff. But um, yeah, and if anyone needs to leave, I will. I will be offended, and I will see you at a party, and I will confront you. No, but. So this is a website, um, it's a dog rescue organization, mm -hmm. and 
one of the pay, one of the nodes is um, dedications that so when people make a donation they can indicate that it's in memory of or in honor of somebody or a dog a person or a dog mm -hmm. and um, so I have a page of dedications of photos and then the text of the dedication and open outreach doesn't have a elegant way of dealing with that you know even as an image gallery because the text part of it is what's lacking I guess right um, I'm not sure the best suggestion for open outreach because I don't work with it as much no I mean because I want to switch oh, how it over would, to open oh I see yeah I mean that would be an advantage is um, because the image the way we handle images in open aid is an image there's an image content type so each image is its own node. And so because of that, one can add fields to the image content type and so provide the, the fields you're talking about for an image. Okay. Um, yeah. Great. So, Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. Enjoy dinner. Um, if you're interested, again, in open aid and also just in this general issue of getting Drupal into the hands of nonprofits. Um, I love talking about that. So find me on Twitter, hit me up after this session. I'm not in a rush yet to go eat. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone.